Hi Dixons, I'm Luke Sparks, Executive Director here at Dixons. Today I'm at Dixons Unity Academy outside in its uh, piazza uh, and what an incredible school it is. The staff, the students, the families have really embraced Dixons and have every right to be so proud of what is being achieved here. Without question this is a school to watch. So this is episode two of a mini series of videos within the growth playlist of our new approach to strategic planning at Dixons. If you have not watched episode one, which explores the levers that can increase the chances of your strategy succeeding, then I would recommend that you take a look at that video before watching this episode. Our fresh approach to strategy has been inspired by a book from McKinsey called Strategy Beyond the Hockey Stick. As ever at Dixon's, we are unafraid to listen to voices beyond education in order to learn taking from them the judicious learning points that we recognise as real levers of change. Of course, some aspects of the book have less direct relevance to our sector, but part of the work of research is being able to sift out the gold. At the very least, the book has challenged our suppositions at Dixon's and provided us with a set of guiding principles to inspire fresh thinking and bold actions. We have added, we have added links to the book and various blogs and videos in the description section of this video. And I would encourage school and trust leaders to look at those or indeed to get in touch with us if we can add more thinking. In this video, we will look at the one often overlooked factor that has perplexed generations of leaders and causes so many strategies to not work out as planned, the social side of strategy. We will explore the social dynamics that undermine strategic dialogue and breed incrementalism if culture eats strategy for breakfast, then nowhere is that more evident than in the strategy room. McKinsey's research and experience suggest that eight specific shifts can dramatically improve the quality of your strategic dialogue, the choices you make and the outcomes you experience. These are shifts that you can start implementing straight away to change what is happening in your strategy room. The first shift is from annual planning to strategy as a journey. At Dixon's, our exec and an increasing number of our Academy senior leadership teams are holding regular strategy conversations. At exec level, we do this through weekly topical meetings and end of cycle reviews. To make these check-ins productive, we maintain a live list of the most important strategic issues, a roster of planned big moves and a pipeline of initiatives for, ex for executing them. At each meeting, we can update one another on live issues in our schools, the expected impact of our initiatives underway, and whether it appears that our planned actions remain sufficient to move the performance needle. Our rolling 12-month plan can be updated as needed, and our two to five year master plan is on stage all the time in strategy sessions, so that it can be adjusted if we change priorities and big moves. In this way, the strategy process becomes a journey. The second shift is from getting to yes to debating real alternatives. The goal of most strategy discussions is to approve or reject a single proposal brought into the room. Suggesting different options or questioning the plan's premise is often unwelcome. However, without such deeper discussion, you are less likely to make the hard to reverse choices that are the essence of real strategy. The conversation changes if you reframe it as a choice-making rather than a plan-making exercise. To enable such discussion, McKinsey suggests building a decision grid. Here is a possible decision grid for a supermarket. For each strategic decision, from price position to category mix, there are three to five possible alternatives. Here we have highlighted Tesco's strategic options. A mainstream price option, 50% private brands, loyalty cards, a large network, moderate service level, and its category mix has an extended range. Whereas Aldi has the lowest possible price position, more than 90% private brands, no loyalty cards, a smaller network, a bare bones service level, and a category mix focused on a core plus one-offs. In this way, at Dixon's, we have started to use decision grids to frame strategy around hard to reverse choices. It is perhaps easy to see how these grids can be used at trust level. However, we are also using them at academy and department level and have even started to use them to make tactical and operational decisions. Like many simple ideas, they have started to become part of our common sense approach. 
Here is an example of a decision grid used by one of our academies to develop a pipeline of initiatives to help execute a big move to be set to leading on curriculum and teaching. The overall strategic options were a few coherent bundles of these choices. As well as framing strategy around hard to reverse choices, it's also important to calibrate aspirations against your endowments, trends and moves to bring an outside view into the strategy room. See the first episode in this Big Moves mini-series for more on endowment, trends and moves. An outside view can lead to some uncomfortable questions, but these are important to help ensure that you make your plans as big as your aspirations. It's okay to aspire to become a 1 in 10 breakout success, provided you have a 1 in 10 strategy. Too often, leaders use up all their boldness in setting the aspiration and have little left when it comes to making the committed strategic choices and moves needed to realise their goal. The third shift is from peanut butter to picking your 1 in 10s. This shift really resonated with us at Dixon's. It is nearly impossible to make big moves if your resources are spread too thinly, especially when in education we have such limited resources to start with. Instead, McKinsey argues that you should allocate resources from a high level view and skew toward the best specific opportunities that can often get averaged out in a more democratic process. School leaders probably typically allocate resources in, a, in more of a trickle down fashion, which will never get the radical kind of resource shift you need. Interestingly, founder leaders are much more successful at betting on the big breakouts. They survey their team to get input on where to invest their resources, but they make the final decision on their own. As a result, they are much more nimble in deploying resources decisively to the most promising initiatives. This links back to the first episode in the Who We Are playlist, where Sir Nick reflects on our history and the founder's mentality. To move away from peanut buttering resources, you need to explicitly address the motivation of your leaders and structure both performance management and incentives accordingly. If some people are taking a bullet for the team, they need to know why and what's in it for them. McKinsey points out that it takes considerable leadership to get everyone to support skewed resource allocations, but just having the conversation about the one in tens starts to reset expectations. The fourth shift is from approving budgets to making big moves. This starts by building a momentum case instead of a base case. The base case minimises obstacles and assumes continual improvement, so a hopeful story. However, this might obscure the view of where the organisation actually stands, which could make it hard to see which aspirations are realistic and certainly which strategic big moves could deliver on those aspirations. McKinsey argues that a way to avoid this trap is to build a proper momentum case. This is a simple version of the future that presumes the organisation's current performance will continue. So the highly probable trajectory without any additional actions rather than the hopeful trajectory of the base case. In this way, you get a sense of how much impact your moves need to deliver to change that trajectory. It's also important to do a teardown of past results to see what came from trends and what came from previous moves. Armed with a thorough, unbiased understanding of where your organisation stands and what has been driving performance, you can focus on what it would take to change your trajectory. As I mentioned previously, see the first episode in this Big Moves mini-series for more on endowment, trends and moves. The fifth shift is from budget inertia to liquid resources. As McKinsey outlines, the handover between strategy and execution happens when the resources are made available to follow through on the big moves you identify. Execution can then begin and managers can be held accountable. To mobilise resources and budget, an organisation needs a certain level of resource liquidity and you have to start early as much as a year before your strategy will need to deploy them. Of course, by resources, we don't just mean money. For example, in schools, think about curriculum time and staffing capacity too. Being incredibly clear about separating the initiatives that free resources from the opportunities to reinvest them is foundational to any meaningful gain and for holding on to resources that you intend to reallocate. 
Another way to enable resource reallocation is to make a certain slither of the budget contestable every year. So money is forced into a pot that is available for reallocation when the time comes. Yet another option is to place an opportunity cost on resources that seem free but are not. This can be as simple as shifting to ratios that encourage managers to cut back on lower value uses for those resources, thereby freeing them up for other opportunities. In schools, CLFP, Curriculum Led Financial Planning, can help with this, something we will share in more detail in future episodes. Also, benchmarks at department level can help us to measure the impact of allocating a subject more money, time and or people, possibly as part of a big move. Without continually freeing up resources, strategy becomes a paper exercise constrained by a limited budget. Again, this is not easy to do in education when we have such limited resources to start with, but an important guiding principle nonetheless. And in our sector, we will almost certainly need to deallocate to reallocate. The sixth shift is from sandbagging to open risk portfolios. This is another shift that really resonated with us at Dixon's. Individual leaders tend to create excessively safe plans that they are sure to achieve. This is called sandbagging. As a result, bold moves can be viewed as too risky and never make the final list that is brought into the strategy room. McKinsey suggests moving from an integrated strategy review to three sequential conversations that focus on firstly an improvement plan that frees up resources, then a growth plan that consumes resources, and then finally a risk management plan that governs the overall strategic plan. This approach triggers a number of shifts. People can lay out their growth plans without always having to add caveats about eventualities that, 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 that could hamper them. You can ask everyone for growth or improvement plans possibly insisting on certain levels to make sure everyone is appropriately imaginative. Only after leaders put their best ideas on the table do you even begin to discuss risk. A high level explicit discussion on risk later in the process might lead to a different answer to the right risk return threshold than would emerge from an assessment made by an individual leader. The seventh shift is from you are your numbers to a holistic perspective on performance. Whatever moves you make, you cannot make them alone. You need to bring your team along. Also, the urge to push individual accountability can actually be counterproductive when it comes to strategy. According to McKinsey, understanding the probabilities of success is foundational. This forms the basis for a reasonable conversation at the end of the year of whether we are looking at a noble failure or a performance failure. At Gore-Tex, for example, teams get data on performance and a vote is done on whether the team and its leaders did the right thing. This vote is often closer to the truth. Ultimately, you need a sense of shared ownership. And it's crucial for people to understand that they won't be punished simply because a high risk plan didn't pan out. And that's why our appraisal process and particularly our professional growth plans or our PGPs here at Dixon's encourage or allow for noble failures and focus on quality of effort. See our video on self-determination theory in the Who We Are playlist for more on our appraisal. And as ever, if there is anything we can add detail to, please let us know and we will record additional material or additional episodes or share resources. So what's important here is that you need to encourage enough risk taking at the individual level so the total risk profile is optimised. Then as risk goes up, you want individuals to be rewarded based on team performance. But of course, there is a balance as you don't want free riders. The eighth and final shift is from long range planning to forcing the first step. This is about putting a disproportionate focus on the first step when discussing long term plans. It's easy to confuse long range planning with long range actions. The only thing we can really control is what we do now. And this is the sharp point of strategy. As we talked about in the first episode in this mini-series, breaking your big moves down into missions that are realistically achievable within a meaningful time frame, say 6 to 12 months, helps to ensure you don't get stuck just imagining the destination. So at first, focus more on actions than results. Don't put too much emphasis on lagging indicators, a look in the rear view mirror. 
but do spend more time checking to make sure that actions are taken and milestones reached. The results will follow. Then match and mobilise the required resources immediately. At Dixon's, we have started to organise agile sprints to get initiatives moving and to force that first step. Indeed, this open source channel is the result of one such sprint. So to conclude this video, McKinsey's research and experience suggest that eight specific shifts can dramatically improve the quality of your strategic dialogue, the choices you make, and the chance of you making big strategic moves. These are shifts that you can start implementing straight away to overcome the perils of the social side of strategy, to overcome the egos and competing agendas, the biases and the social games that can each affect the decisions made in the strategy room. The two shifts that have proved particularly impactful at Dixon's are debating real alternatives and don't peanut butter. But keep in mind that the eight shifts are a package deal. If you don't pursue all of them together, you open the field to new social games. It also takes a genuine intervention to jolt your team into this new way of thinking. McKinsey suggests creating a new strategy process that reserves 10 days per year for top team conversations and introduce the shifts one meeting at a time. At Dixon's it took us a similar number of days to make that jolt, but spread over the year. And it has been well worth investing that time. Because after all, if culture eats strategy for breakfast, then nowhere is that more evident than in the strategy room. The final videos in this mini-series on big moves will introduce you to some of our principals who will talk through their big moves and how they apply this new way of thinking to their strategic planning. I really hope you will join us for those as they promise to provide practical insight into this new way of thinking. Please do subscribe now to this channel to be notified of videos as they come up. We're trying to release two every week and thank you for listening.